Welcome to the G-Care Orthodontic Webinar Series on Mini Implants. My name is uh, Dr. Richard Kaisley. I'm an orthodontist based in the UK and I uh, qualified as an orthodontist in 1998. I've been using uh, Mini Implants for the last 10 years and today I'm going to speak to you about uh, Mini Implant Principles. Uh, for background reading, um, I've written a textbook which will be available from April 2013 called the Orthodontic Mini Implant Clinical Handbook. This provides a detailed step-by-step -step, uh, description of the processes used from various scenarios for mini implant usage such as a typical class 2 division 1 uh, treatment involving incisor retraction. It means that you can read the, the specific chapter in the book and then follow those steps both during your planning and uh, actual clinical treatment stages. So today, as I said, we'll, we'll go through the theoretical and clinical basis for orthodontic mini implants. So I'll explain how mini implants work and where they've originated from, and particularly look at those factors uh, which may affect how well a mini implant works in terms of its success or potential failure. As I uh, conduct this webinar, I'm based in, uh, in an area of England shown by the red circle. And this area is significant because approximately five miles from my, uh, my home is uh, this place called Wilthorpe Manor. And it's famous uh, because it was where Sir Isaac Newton was born in 1642 and subsequently undertook much of his theoretical work. This is the orchard where the, uh, the fable apple fell. And this is all relevant today because of Newton's third law. So every time we apply traction to a tooth or a group of teeth, we generate an equal and an opposite reaction and hence the need for anchorage. We're best to view uh, bone anchorage devices or TADs um, in several different categories according to their evolution. So for instance, if one uh, modified restorative implants which rely on osseointegration and particularly reduce the dimensions, then uh, that would produce an orthodontic implant um, such as the original palatal implants which were uh, particularly used in, at the uh, turn of the century. However, if one took the plating kits from maxillofacial surgery, which rely on mechanical retention, not on osseointegration, if you modify the plate, you produce a mini plate, and if you modify the screw, you produce a mini screw or a mini implant, as I like to term them. So having evolved from bone fixation screws and relying on mechanical stability or retention, um, one of the beauties of uh, mini implants is that their small size means they can be put in almost any location in the mouth, particularly in interproximal sites. It's also very neat that they're simple to remove and simple to insert in the first place, and that's particularly good from both the orthodontist's perspective and also that of the, of the patient, so that both the insertion and removal stages should be as straightforward as possible. Because we're not relying on osseointegration, then we can apply traction immediately after insertion. And the, I find that the more an orthodontist uses mini implants and integrates them into their clinical practice, then the, the wider range of applications that, which become apparent, uh, and hence we, we, we tend to see more and more applications nowadays compared with even a few years ago. So in a sense, we're greatly expanding our treatment possibilities and also expanding the orthodontic envelope and perhaps correction of anterior open bites is, is one of the best examples of that. Fortunately, there's no requirement uh, for the patient uh, to tolerate and, and look after many plants over and above that required for a fixed appliance treatment. So if they can look after and keep a fixed appliance clean, uh, then they're very good candidates for mini implant anchorage. One of the beauties of, of this anchorage is that there is flexibility in terms of timing. We can add the anchorage uh, at the start of treatment. We can deliberately perform some of the treatment, particularly alignment, and then add the anchorage. Or if the treatment is not progressing particularly well, we can add uh, 
this anchorage at a later stage in treatment. Because we can predict and have more reliable anchorage, we can also then start to predict the treatment mechanics and the outcome better. So for instance, if one has an adult patient uh, with an increased overjet, which is suitable for camouflage treatment, then we can now be confident that we will properly reduce the overjet because we are confident in our anchorage control. So our outcome is more predictable. If our treatment mechanics um, are made as efficient as possible, then we're also looking at reduced treatment times. But there is a slight paradox in this. Um, if anchorage has been lost, say, during closure of a bicuspid space, then ironically the space will close from both directions and hence the, the, the space closure time will be reduced. But with mini implants, if the space has been closed only from one direction, then that means that the space closing phase will, will technically take longer for, say, the incisor and uh, canine teeth to move fully into the, the bicuspid space. So it's more effective treatment but because it's avoiding anchorage loss, then that stage can take a little longer. One of the things I really appreciate with mini implants is the fact that we can control anchorage in all three dimensions. Uh, and I think this is fundamentally different from conventional anchorage options. And it would be very unusual in my clinical practice to find an adult patient who would not uh, accept the thought of um, mini implant anchorage. And indeed, many, many teenagers are both suitable for mini implants and very accepting of this uh, new technology. The literature base on mini implants is still relatively immature, so there, are, there aren't many randomized controlled, controlled trials available. Uh, but, but one very useful one published in 2008 in the American Journal of Orthodontics, studied uh, 18 patients in each group. Uh, one was conventional anchorage group with headgear, and the other was a mini implant anchorage group, and both groups had uh, first bicuspids extracted. Notably, uh, the headgear patients lost an average almost half of that bicuspid space. But in contrast, the mini implant group not only failed to lose anchorage, but they actually gained anchorage, which is perhaps a new concept to us. And that's because the retraction of the anterior segment of teeth continued after the bicuspid space uh, was closed in each quadrant and hence caused the molars to distalize slightly. But we also started to get a flavor that the anchorage affects three dimensions because in this study, the maxillary molars were intruded and this caused a small uh, autorotation of the mandible to, to make the class two element less. The other thing that's, that's becoming more apparent nowadays is that we're not only looking at controlling our anchorage, but in fact we're looking at better ways of affecting the movement of the uh, target teeth. So for instance, if we're retracting the incisors, we, can, we have new biomechanics, particularly involving power arms, which help us to not just retrocline the incisors, but actually affect true bodily retraction of the incisors. And that's notable because compared with uh, one and two stage uh, retraction of the anterior teeth, as studied uh, by Giro et al. Uh, and published in the American Journal in 2010, uh, in their st study, the incisors retroclined by a substantial amount in both groups, uh, which were in all patients had headgear, anchorage. So th the anchorage in this paper isn't the issue, it's the fact that the incisor movement is, is less well controlled than we can now see with uh, mini implant biomechanics. And the mini implant RCT is also supported by a variety of retrospective studies in the literature, and I expect that there's much more to be published on this in the coming years. So I would argue that, uh, that despite conventional wisdom that headgear is the, is the optimum anchorage, but in fact for the 21st century, I would contest that uh, mini implants are really the best anchorage. But I think it's important to, to recognize that all treatments and all techniques have some limitations and problems. So for instance, 
there is a, um, a rough age limit, at both at the lower age uh, end of the spectrum and the upper age end of the spectrum for mini implant usage. So for instance, in very young patients, we may find that we have higher failure rates. And in older osteoporotic patients, we may also find the same. But this means that for the, for the vast majority of orthodontic patients undergoing uh, comprehensive treatment, then mini implant usage can be considered. A growing group of patients that may pose a problem uh, will be those on bisphosphonates, but notably this, and this is also a contraindication to orthodontic treatment in general. So perhaps the, the biggest practical limitation in a day-to-day -day sense is whether we have enough bone at the ideal insertion uh, site, and that relates to the proximity of the roots in that uh, area. Mini implant fracture is f fortunately uh, an unusual event, but can certainly cause problems, and, and it's best to avoid this potential where we can. If the insertion uh, technique is not ideal, then uh, one runs the risk of, of making the, uh, the insertion bed or hole too wide, or if we um, try and bone drill, then there's a risk of bone necrosis. So in effect, the, the problem which concerns me the most in my day-to-day -day practice is the risk of instability or looseness of mini implant, and hence it's not able to tolerate uh, force application. I find it very unusual um, for an infection or peri-implantitis problem to occur. What I tend to see is, uh, is minor hyperplastic reaction of the uh, adjacent soft tissues, and it's very rare to see a, a formal acute infection. And the other aspect of the soft tissues is that if the mini implant um, emerges too far from the surface, then it can annoy and, and traumatize the, the lip and bocomucosal tissues. There are a number of identified risks when it comes to mini implant insertion, and particularly many of us um, in the past have been concerned about potential damage to root cementum, but as I'll cover late, later in this webinar, uh, this is not such a, a worry nowadays. We may be concerned about perforation of the nasal or sinus floor, or indeed uh, damage to neurovascular tissues. Uh, but in particular, um, the insertion of a mini implant would have to be radically, um, I would say, off track in order to risk damage to any significant neurovascular uh, bundles, perhaps except, except the uh, mid palate suture and uh, nasopalatine tissues. But again, these can be avoided when one is uh, opting for mid palate insertion. So again, in my clinical practice, I view that the main problem or risk for mini implant usage is the instability or looseness um, problem, which the literature currently uh, quotes between 10 and 20 percent. And I don't think we want the mini implant to integrate uh, because then it would it would be a, a, quite a, an ordeal to remove an integrated uh, fixture. When I think about mini implant indications, I think about the usage in three dimensions. So if we start with perhaps the dimension we're, we're most used to, and that's the anterior posterior one, particularly in the scenario of retracting in prominent incisors. Or we may wish to distalize the molars, first of all, to create space. Or in a patient missing uh, premolars or molar teeth, then we may wish to protract the molars and bring, bring them forward to space close. But the dimension which is particularly novel is the vertical um, one, and that's where we can now intrude either single or blocks of teeth, or indeed move the teeth into the line of the arch, such as an ectopic canine tooth. I find mini implants very neat for transverse correction because if one has um, a patient with a significant centerline discrepancy, then we only really need to reinforce anchorage on one side of the arch and one quadrant, whereas conventional anchorage uh, inadvertently reinforces anchorage on, on both sides, and that can be a nuisance. And it's particularly neat if we want to uh, alter occlusal planes, uh, such as intrude the, uh, the teeth on one side of uh, of the arch relative to the other side. 
And depending on one's clinical caseload, there are a variety of other uh, uses. Uh, for instance, um, the use of class 3 and class 3 elastic traction, uh, in which case it's applied to the mini implants. Um, and this can particularly be useful for orthognathic surgical patients. A variety of case reports have been published showing uh, restoration of um, mini implants. So for instance, a, a placing a crown on a mini implant in a lateral incisor region. Um, but there's still much debate over the, the, the optimum uh, process and the biology in this respect. So it's something that I'll not cover in the, in the webinars at present. Whenever I'm discussing mini implant usage with a patient, then I'll cover several key points. First of all, it's very useful to explain why they need anchorage as part of their treatment, what's involved in the insertion process, and then simply to reassure them that the removal process is very, is very straightforward. Again, in, ter in terms of main risks, I would highlight that the biggest problem is instability or looseness of the, the mini implant, but I would also reassure them that if a mini implant does come loose that they're unlikely to notice it and it's certainly uh, rarely a painful occurrence. Mini implant fracture um, can occur and depending on the system which you use uh, then if it's a relatively cylindrical design that uh, then there's a higher risk of fracture involved. And it's worth also informing the patient of any requirements in terms of analgesia and hygiene. Um, it's been found that the analgesic requirements are, are really very low. And again, hygiene requirements are uh, very straightforward from the patient's point of view. What I'd recommend is providing an information leaflet for the patient at this stage uh, so they have the, everything in writing as well as uh, been, having been explained to verbally. So one may use the manufacturer's leaflets, or indeed the American Orthodontic Association's uh, leaflets. But what's very important is to use patient-friendly terms. So do try and describe things uh, such as using terms such as small anchor. And the word anchor um, is easily recognized by patients in terms of understanding what an anchor, what purpose it performs. Uh, and it's much better than just than telling you're going to screw a bolt into their jawbone. That's that's not particularly conducive or, or relaxing for the patient. I don't personally mention the risk of acute infection uh, or root trauma because acute infections occur in less than 1% of mini implant insertions. And because root trauma, as we shall see later on, is more of a theoretical risk. Um, the way I find it best to consider these things is that if there's a conflict, a close proximity between a mini implant and uh, a tooth, then it's the mini implant which will fail, uh, not the tooth. Particularly when one's adopting mini implant um, techniques for the first time, then I think it's particularly important to identify appropriate cases uh, and ones which are relatively straightforward in other respects. So we may find an adult patient who, particularly in the female population, uh, may well have uh, various body piercings, although the, uh, the piercing in this photograph um, is not one of mine. The patient does have many implants in place, but, uh, but not through her lip. And frequently adults patients can require substantial tooth movements but may have limited anchorage potential because of either uh, hyperdontia or premature loss of teeth um, reducing the potential anchor teeth uh, units or indeed those teeth may have reduced root support due to periodontal losses but arguably there are many routine cases uh, both in, in teenagers and in adults that would benefit from uh, reliable anchorage control At this stage, we'll look in much more detail at the research literature. And in the last few years, there have been literally hundreds of um, studies and publications uh, put out on orthodontic mini implants, uh, which do reassure us in the sense that uh, this is a well-grounded um, technique. 
And it's best to look at the evidence in terms of the overall success rates for mini implants. The patient factors which may affect mini implant success, particularly zooming in at the insertion site, the anatomy which is relevant in that area. There are also details in terms of mini implant design and insertion technique which are relevant to success. And also how we apply the traction and use the mini implants once they're in place. It's worth considering what, what it's like from the patient's point of view and any factors which they uh, may uh, affect mini implant success over time. And finally, is there any evidence on removal of the mini implants? So looking at general success rates, first of all, uh, the literature generally defines success as a mini implant remaining uh, stationary and comfortable under static orthodontic loading for a minimum of six months, but frequently a minimum of a year in, in many of the papers published. What's interesting for literature uh, and also from clinical practice is that even mini implants with a small degree of mobility can still be successfully loaded. So for instance, in one of the first uh, case series published in 2006 by Parkadal in the American Journal of Orthodontics, one in five of their successful mini implants displayed a minor degree of mobility. Overall, uh, the success rate in the maxilla tends to be reported as around 90% in uh, certainly in experienced hands. But in the mandible, the success rate is slightly less at 80%, and we'll, we'll highlight the reasons for that in a moment. One of the biggest case series published, uh, in this case, in the, in the Angle Orthodontist Journal in 2010, uh, showed 778 self-drilling mini implants, uh, which have been placed con uh, in consecutive patients. The success rate in total in uh, a multiple um, number of sites was approximately 80%. But what's particularly interesting in this study is that the vast majority of failures occurred within the first few months. And the mean time to failure was under two months. And that's particularly good because it means if a mini implant's going to fail, it tends to fail early in treatment and then one can either replace it or, or um, re-examine the treatment goals and uh, protocol. And certainly in my clinical practice, if I see a patient, um, say a month, after mini implant insertion, and then particularly by several months, um, that if there are no problems at that stage, I would, I would uh, assume that uh, everything will be fine. It would be very unlikely for a mini implant to fail after several months. And the reasons for this come down in patient terms to, for instance, whether they've got a high or a low angle. And where several papers have shown that patients with a high maxillary mandibular angle or a long face have a higher failure rate for buccal uh, insertion sites. And the reason for that appears to be that these patients anatomically have thinner um, cortical plate in the, on the buccal side of the maxilla. Uh, it's slightly ironic that these are also the patients we may wish to insert mini implants posteriorly to correct an open bite. But uh, that's one reason I opt for palatal insertion sites in these cases. Age is relevant because generally uh, the older the patient gets the higher success rate, particularly in terms of the transition from a teenage uh, growing patient to an adult patient. And the reason for this is because teenagers are still growing, so they have a high bone turnover rate and they have a thinner cortex uh, and a lower density of that cortex than, than there will as an adult. Smoking is a relative contraindication because it's been shown that heavy smokers do have a massively increased failure rate. Uh, so for instance, in this study from Germany, the failure rate uh, was 58% in heavy smokers compared to um, approximately 15% in, uh, in non-smokers. And it appears to be uh, the result of interference with gingival healing from smoking, and these also are likely to be patients who may have more plaque retention. But what's clear from the literature is that uh, a variety of factors don't appear to affect success, and this is what the uh, sex of the patient is, how class two or class three they are before treatment, how much crowding they have, 
what the perio status is, provided it's uh, controlled, and whether they have a history of TMD or not. Then if we focus on the insertion site, it's worth bearing in mind that the insertion site is a three-dimensional area, not just a two-dimensional uh, site that we may be accustomed to when viewing um, two-dimensional radiographs, such that the when one cross-sections the alveolar crest, it's triangular in shape, not, um, not a rectangular block. And hence, the further we go from the alveolar crest to the gingival margin, the wider the uh, alveolus is, and hence there's more buccopalatal depth. And that gives us more bone volume, and hence the concept of more safety or more space between the roots of teeth. But if we uh, go too far uh, away from the gingival uh, margin in the maxillary arch, then we start to approximate the maxillary sinus. Again, in three dimensions, because of the, the, the roots of the molar teeth, there, there is more space on the palatal side of the alveolus uh, than there is on the buccal side in the upper arch. But one key thing to bear in mind is that patients are all different, so there are variations in the shape of individual patients' teeth and the angulations of those teeth pre-treatment and such that this may uh, affect the space available between uh, the roots of teeth. So on average, uh, if we look at the upper uh, second bicuspid, the first molar interproximal space, which tends to be a fairly classical insertion site for many implants, then on the buccal side of the arch, there's usually about three millimeters of space between the roots. But on the palatal side, there's five millimeters because there's only a single palatal root on the molar. If we allow a quarter of a millimeter of uh, distance for the periodontal ligament on both sides, then in a sense we lose half a millimeter of space. And consequently, the, I don't use two millimeter diameter mini implants in interproximal sites. I only use those in edentulous and mid palate areas. It's important to remember that, uh, that the, the interproximal space changes as we move from the cortical surface uh, towards the, the most narrow part of the roots. So I'll show that diagrammatically in a moment. And again, just remembering that the uh, shape of the roots are, th are uh, tapered in three dimensions, but also most mini implants are also tapered, so the tip of the mini implant is smaller than the, uh, the main part of the body. So when one looks at the second bicuspid, first molar and second molar teeth um, as viewed on the uh, undersurface almost, and then the palatal cortex and the buccal cortex, then we can see that there's more space between the roots um, close to the surface on the buccal side compared with the most narrow point between the roots of the, uh, the second bicuspid and the uh, first molar. But in particular, on, in the same interproximal location from the palate side, there's, there's a lot more interproximal space. And in the mandible, when we look again at the second bicuspid, first molar and second molar region, we can first of all see that the, the cortical plate is thicker in the mandible than in the maxilla. And we can see that the interproximal space between the bicuspid and the first molar is greater because the, the first molar only has two roots, not three roots. And on the buccal side, uh, in the intermolar region, then there really is quite a long distance from the surface before one approximates the, the most narrow space between the first and second molar roots. However, this is often a, 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 a site which is difficult to access intraorally. So in summary, the factors which influence success at, at an anatomical level um, are really which job we insert the mini implant in, and at present the maxillary success rates are higher than the mandible. Then there is variation within the jaw. So for instance, in the upper jaw, the success rates are higher on the palate side than they are on for buccal insertions. <coughs> 
And in the mandible, there are more failures in the posterior mandible uh, than in the, uh, uh, say, the, the bicuspid region. When we consider the soft tissue uh, elements, then it's generally recognized that insertion through um, attached mucosa is best because insertion through non carotenized or loose mucosa often results in a higher failure rate. And one of the key things which starts to emerge is the cortical thickness and the density of this thin layer of bone are the critical factors which affect mini implant stability. So just to orient it, um, everyone at this stage, then the typical thickness of a, of a cortical plate in the buccal side is, is only one or two millimeters of tissue. But this does vary because the more distal or posterior um, the insertion site, then the thicker the cortex. And also when mum moves from the alveolar crest towards the apex, um, then again, the buccal cortex tends to become more thick. It's particularly useful that the cortex is, is relatively thicker around the canines in the maxillary arch, so hence the canine eminence, and also around the first molars. And these are two typical insertion sites. So we would tend to insert many implants, um, say, distal to the uh, canines if we're trying to protract the molars. But for a lot of anchorage reinforcement cases, uh, which require posterior anchorage reinforcement, then uh, mesial to the f uh, first molars is a classical insertion site. The palate cortex is slightly thicker than the, the equivalent uh, cortex in the buccal side. But there are also variations according to the insertion angle. So for instance, if one uses a slightly oblique insertion angle. And what I, might, what I mean by oblique insertion is uh, rather than inserting perpendicular to the surface, then by angling the uh, mini implant towards the apical uh, direction, say by 20 or 30 degrees in the upper arch, or by a smaller amount in the lower arch, then we can effectively engage more of the cortex depth. Then when we consider the density of the cortex rather than the, uh, the depth, the uh, density of the cortex is, is greater in the mandible than in the maxilla. And that's not really a surprise, given that we all regard the mandible as a tougher bone. Interestingly, the cancellous bone is pretty much the same density in both arches. In the mandible, there's then a progressive increase in density as one uh, moves from the anterior to the posterior mandibular sites. So in a, in a sense, one could regard cancellous bone as being um, slightly irrelevant in some of the posterior mandibular insertion sites, but we do tend to rely on some contribution for, uh, from cancellous bone stability in the maxillary sites. And, uh, and at a practical level, what this means is I would tend to use a longer length of mini implant um, in the maxilla than I would in the posterior mandible. So I may use, uh, say, a 9 millimeter body length in the maxilla, whereas in the mandible I may be more comfortable using a 6 millimeter length, uh, particularly between the uh, uh, second bicuspid and first molar. So cortical bone is the most relevant part of the, uh, the jaw when it comes to mini implants. And final element analysis showed that the forces for mini implant uh, loading are concentrated in the cortex. And so if we increase the insertion, the depth of cortex, then we find the insertion torque also increases. And torque is the amount of resistance to rotational movement. So in effect, if a mini implant is easy to insert, then that, that indicates low torque, or if it's very hard to rotate a screwdriver, then that's, that's high insertion torque. And the thicker the cortical layer is, then the higher the insertion torque. And hence the higher, generally speaking, the higher the success rate. And if we if it increase the density of the cortex, then that also causes the insertion torque to rise. But there is a caveat in this, in the sense that excessively dense bone 
will result in excessively um, high insertion torque and consequently an ischemic necrosis. And how this manifests uh, would be that if a mini implant, say in the posterior mandible, is really quite hard to insert and takes a lot of rotational pressure or torque to insert, then uh, one may think, wow, that's going to be a very um, secure uh, fixture. But what tends to happen over time, within the next month or two, is that microscopic necrosis happens in the bone around the mini implant threads and hence it loosens. So it's a, it's a secondary failure. So at the moment, um, I don't expect orthodontists to measure the insertion torque on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's a, what's been identified as an ideal window of torque, which range, ranges from 5 to 15 newton centimetres. And so if, the, if our torque falls below 5 uh, newton centimetres, then that indicates per primary stability, so the mini implant won't be particularly stable on day one. But if the insertion torque is excessive, then that high torque can result in secondary failures. The mini implant would be firm uh, at the start, have apparently good primary stability, but then become loose over time. So again, in summary, the anatomical factors which are relevant are the insertion site. So at the present, the maxillary success rates are higher than the mandible. We tend to avoid lingual insertions altogether because of their low uh, success rates, particularly because of interference with the tongue. And also the uh, lingual side of the mandible can, can be quite an uncomfortable place uh, for a fixture to poke out from the patient's point of view. But overall, it's the thickness and the density of the cortical plate which are the key factors. And this can be a problem in high angle patients uh, where the buccal cortex is, is thinner. And overall, the most, uh, most insertions are performed through attached gingiva as uh, the best way of guaranteeing the soft tissue effect and success. So if we now look at design factors as opposed to patient factors, it's very clear that the wider the diameter of the mini implant or any indeed screw fixture, then the greater the bone surface area which is engaged or connected to the threads. And this increases the insertion torque. And an increase in diameter tends to have a much greater effect on insertion torque than an increase in uh, the mini implant length. So hence we get greater primary stability with wider diameter mini implants. And over time less deflection or tipping of that mini implant uh, because of less strain in the bone uh, when it's loaded. The other key element is a bigger diameter mini implant is much less likely to fracture, it's much stronger. And so for instance, the radiograph on the right shows a mini implant uh, which fractured um, approximately in, two, uh, in 2005, 2006. And at that stage, mini implants had a cylindrical body design uh, and hence much more certainly the mini implants I currently use have a tapered design which, which has a wider diameter and is hence stronger. But the problem is if you increase the, the diameter of the mini implant too much, then you start to limit the insertion sites. Uh, there are fewer places you can put the mini implant. Also, the balance can tip too far and create excessive insertion torque. Then instead, if we try to increase the length of mini implant, well, that length gives us more engagement of the bone, but it gives us more engagement of cancellous bone, not cortical bone. Hence, the ten an increase in length tends to have less effect on primary stability. But it does have a small tendency to increase success rates overall, and particularly probably reduce the drift or tilting of a, of a mini implant over time. But again, if the mini implant is too long, then it starts to limit the insertion sites and increase the risk of perforation, for instance, of the maxillary sinus. So in summary, diameter is more important than length of the mini implant. And in many respects, the choice would be to use a two millimeter diameter mini implant where possible, but this isn't usually um, practical in interproximal sites.
So I use a 1.5 millimeter diameter uh, mini implant in my interproximal insertions. And as I mentioned earlier, I use a, a longer or nine millimeter body length for insertions in the maxilla where the, where the cortex is relatively thin. When we look at design features, mini implants are roughly classified as either being self-tapping or uh, self-drilling. And self-tapping or non-drilling uh, mini implants have uh, relatively indistinct threads and a much wider uh, proportion of, of the core diameter relative to the threads. In contrast, self-drilling designs look a bit more like a corkscrew, so they've got very sharp, well-defined threads, and these uh, are the element which cuts into the bone. So in general terms, self-tapping screws, which require a full-depth pilot hole, so if you have a 9mm mini implant, you need to drill a 9mm hole. They have a, a tip which is notched and then threads which tap or form a, th a pattern in the, uh, the hole. Whereas self-drilling screws form uh, a hole and behave like a corkscrew, so there's no need for a pilot hole. And it's because of the sharp tip and threads, and these also expel the bone debris towards the surface. And design does matter because when studies have looked and compared it tapered designs uh, where the taper, the mini implant body tapers or widens out towards the, the head of the mini implant, then these designs have been found to have higher insertion torque than uh, cylindrical designs. Because the torque increases with diameter, especially as the wider part of the, the tapered body is inserted, so hence during the final through stage of, of insertion. And self-drilling and tapered designs tend to be um, combined together, and these provide an increased contact uh, at a histological level between the bone and the implant surface. They provide an increased insertion torque and, and better primary stability at a clinical level, especially in the maxilla. And over time, less displacement or tipping of the um, mini implant under loading. So in a sense, one could look at it that the avoidance of pre-drilling um, preserves more of the original bony architecture. So in summary, the influential factors are the shape and the, th the design of the threads. With self-drilling being uh, better than uh, self-tapping designs, and the body diameter, we tend to, to recommend around about 1.5 millimeter diameter for interproximal sites and the body length is, is less uh, relevant. The neck length, which I haven't mentioned, does have an effect because of um, the tilting or lever effect. So a long neck fixture will cause a tilting effect and cause excess strain uh, on the bone at the, at the contact point between the, the mini implant body and the cortex. So in a sense, it's best to avoid uh, a mini implant, which is a, a very prominent head, or due to either a high head uh, length or indeed neck length, especially co combined with a short body length. That would be the most unfavorable ratio. Then if we look at insertion technique, First of all, it's apparent, as with all techniques, that there is a learning curve. So when we first bonded uh, brackets onto patients, I'm sure that we find that we had a much higher debond or failure rate than we now uh, currently do in our clinical practice. And in many implant terms, clinically inexperience has been shown to result in a higher risk of root proximity or contact, and hence lower success rates. So the good news, in the sense, is that with experience, our, our success rates will increase. And the other technique element is that uh, clinical inexperience uh, ha leads to a higher risk of uh, fractured mini implants during insertion. So pre-drilling is, is relevant because if you, one does pre-drill, then the wider the diameter of the, pre, of the pilot drill relative to the mini implant, then the lower the insertion torque, and also the deeper we drill, then the lower the insertion torque. And the greatest reduction in torque with drilling occurs within the first couple of millimeters, and that's because the cortex has been uh, perforated. <laughs>
And clinically, we feel that with, say, a, a drilling uh, process or even a self-drilling insertion, that once the cortex is perforated, once the first few threads uh, of the mini implant pass through the surface and through the cortex, then uh, the, the insertion torque reduces. So insertion torque really is the key uh, during the, the process of insertion. But also, it's, it's common sense that access is relevant because we all find that it's easier to access uh, sites at the front of the mouth than it is at the back of the mouth. And the cheek can have quite a high bearing on this. So one can imagine a, a patient where it's relatively difficult to, to put an, an impression tray into their mouth because of very inflexible uh, or taut cheek tissues. Then equally, these will be the same patients where during mini implant insertion, the cheek will tend to, to nudge the screwdriver uh, forwards in the mouth, and this may um, cause a problem with the insertion direction. So when one considers pros and cons of pilot drilling, then the disadvantages are clearly that it's an extra clinical step. It requires slow handpiece uh, and particularly saline irrigation uh, control. So uh, these are often aspects which aren't readily uh, in the offices of orthodontists in terms of the kit. But, and pre-drilling can run the risk of making the insertion hole or bed uh, too wide and generating excess heat, which then causes bone resorption. And finally, it's easier to perforate or drill into something like a root of a tooth with a sharp pilot drill than it would be with a mini implant. So are there any advantages? Well, there's one key advantage. And in some areas, it's, it's beneficial to reduce the insertion torque. So in effect, in the posterior mandible in adults and also the mid palate, uh, where the, these are areas where the insertion torque may be too high because of the density and thickness of the cortex. So in these patients, there is an advantage to pre-drilling. But by pre-drilling, I mean perforation of the cortex. And one solution to this, which I use, is a cortical bone punch, uh, which is available in, in some kits. And this is used to perforate the cortex. I've mentioned in brief that oblique insertion is, is uh, relevant. From a positional perspective, this means that if you insert or direct a mini implant towards the apical uh, aspect of the roots, then you're moving in between the, the tapered part of the roots and hence avoiding root proximity. And from a stability point of view, uh, several studies have shown that there is better bone contact and hence higher insertion torque when a mini implant is inserted at, say, a 20 to 30 degree angle towards the uh, apex of the teeth. And that's because it provides greater engagement with the cortical bone rather than traversing straight through it. And that's particularly useful in the maxilla where the cortex tends to be thinner and slightly less dense. And hence, uh, we, there's an advantage to be gained by an oblique insertion. But by oblique, I do mean 20 to 30 degrees um, inclination in an epical direction. If one inserts mini implant at, say, 45 degrees, then it means that the mini, part of the mini implant head will still stick out slightly from the surface, and that can irritate the patient's cheek. So when we look at the effects of root proximity, a very useful study in this respect was published in the American Journal in 2007 by Kuroda et al., and they uh, took post-insertion radiographs and classified these in three categories, such that category A had some clear uh, space or bone around the mini implant and away from the roots of teeth. Category B uh, radiographically had no overlap of the tip of the mini implant from the adjacent root. And category C had more clear uh, overlap of the uh, mini implant body and an adjacent root. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the closer the proximity of the mini implant, then the lower the success rate. So hence the success rate in category A was 93%, but in category C was 62%. And this was particularly the case for mandibular insertions, where the, the success rate was even lower. Interestingly, when the authors took 3D CTs of, of these of patients, 
uh, then they, they find that these screws were not technically in contact with the roots of teeth, but just in close proximity. So they concluded that uh, root proximity, not contact as such, is the risk factor. And it's likely that this is because of occlusal uh, and masticatory forces jiggling in the periodontal ligament, and this, these forces being transmitted to the mini implant. Uh, and that's particularly the case with the thinner bone margin between the, uh, the mini implant and periodontal ligament. But does root contact really matter? Well, several studies have uh, looked at this, uh, and in, in a sense they've tried to traumatize the roots of teeth in both animal and human studies uh, by as much as possible. What's interesting in human studies, when they've inserted mini implants uh, and then moved the teeth into contact with the mini implants, these patients did not complain of pain and there were no ankylosis problems. But what's clear is that root contact leads to a sort of massive increase in insertion torque. So normally speaking, when a mini implant is inserted, if a root is contacted, apart from the fact that the patient usually feels the discomfort, uh, you'll also come to standstill with a screwdriver. And root contact does increase the failure rate. Interestingly, at the histological level, there doesn't need to be actual contact to, to have some degree of root resorption affecting the surface. But the good news is that all of the studies show that root repair occurs within the first couple of months of the uh, contact. And this is by the formation of a cellular layer of cement at the uh, trauma site. And indeed, when uh, the roots of teeth have actually been gouged by a drilling process, then the, um, the affected area fills in and the bone on the opposing side of the alveolus recontours to match. So in, in, in many ways, the body takes care of itself. And that's provided that there's no inflammation present, but with um, normal insertions, uh, that's the case. But there is a solution. And I, I use what I term as a three-dimensional insertion stent, either for buccal insertions or particularly for more difficult access places such as the palate. And in the picture on the right side, we can see that a three-dimensional plastic guide cylinder dictates the direction of insertion of the mini implant by dictating the, the screwdriver fit inside the cylinder. And one can still see the mini implant through the cylinder. So this is something that we'll highlight in the second lecture. And we apply traction to the mini implants, then there is a, a, an effect because traction or forces applied within the physiological limit actually increase the bone around the mini implant and reduce its resorption. So in effect, over time, the, there's more contact but established between the mini implant surface and the adjacent bone. And that's particularly at the coronal end in terms of the cortex and also at the apical end. So that leads to secondary stability, so the increase of stability over time. And interestingly, one clinical study by Garfinkel et al. showed the success rate of loaded mini implants was higher at 80% than unloaded ones at 61%. And the problem with excessive forces, for instance, is that they may increase mini implant displacement or shifting particularly in thin cortex tissues. So when we think of, of, in terms of bone biology, first of all, after a mini implant is put in, then there's an inflammatory response, uh, which occurs within the first few days. There's then some microscopic resorption around the threads of the mini implant, which predominates for the first two weeks. There's a switch over a latency period for another two weeks, followed by predominantly new bone formation, which really uh, comes to the fore by six weeks after the insertion, such that uh, by 13 weeks or three months after insertion, the bone situation has largely stabilized. What this means that, uh, for instance, in studies, that a mini implant's easier to pull out uh, within the first couple of stages compared with the later stages of bone biology and bone, the bone cycle. So the take home message from that is that we should avoid overloading a mini implant, particularly within the first month when there's predominantly an inflammatory and resorption uh, reaction in the bone.
And this is relevant when one considers the age of the patient, as the study by Motorashi at an American journal published in 2007 highlights. So they compared 30 adolescent patients who either had mini implants loaded within the first few weeks or loaded after three months of early or late loading. And they also included 27 adults who all had their mini implants loaded early. In the adult cases, the success rate was respe very respectable at 92%. But in the adolescents, the success rate was greatly affected by the timing of loading. So the early loaded group only had 63% success compared with 97% success when loaded uh, after three months. So the, the message here is that adults uh, may readily tolerate early loading, but adolescents, uh, then that early loading could be a, uh, a limitation and one may have to consider delayed loading by up to three months. So the latency period or the time before loading is a significant factor in adolescence. So in conclusion, immediate loading is, is feasible, particularly in adults. But if in doubt, especially if there's been a low insertion torque in adolescents who are thinner bone, then it's important to load at a very light level for the first five to six weeks, for, um, possibly even for three months. Uh, and by light loading, we generally mean around about 50 grams of force application. But fortunately, loading within limits, uh, say of 200, 250 grams, can increase the stability of the mini implant over time. Then with regard to mini implant stability, in some respects I've already mentioned this, but several studies do show that there's a small degree of mobility or, or rather movement of the mini implant over time in the direction of the, the force, the traction. But this tends to be a tipping movement rather than a, a sort of bodily displacement. And it's not the mini, that the mini implant feels loose at a clinical level, but it's, it, it does migrate slightly over time. So it's best not to regard mini implants as absolutely stationary. And it tends to be a problem where the head and the neck of the mini implant projects far out from the surface because of the lever effect of the traction. So in some respects, this patient here is having intrusion of a lower uh, second bicuspid and had several missing molars. During the intrusion process, the uh, bicuspid did uh, actively intrude into the alveolus, but there's also a, a subtle extrusion of the mini implant. But the point is that these sorts of movements are not discernible at a clinical level. And in the long term, it, the, from, the, from the patient's point of view, first of all, is the process uncomfortable? Several good studies have looked at this and uh, unexpected. Uh, well, perhaps it's not a surprise that many patients expect a high level of pain when we describe the insertion process. But fortunately, most of the patients overestimate the uh, discomfort to the extent that three quarters of patients have been shown to have little or no uh, pain at the time of insertion. And indeed, it's a, this sort of discomfort of pain is equivalent to them having orthodontic separators placed or an alignment wire um, but particularly less than the pain of, associated with, say, an 016 uh, alignment wire, and certainly much less than the pain involved with extractions. Most patients describe the discomfort as a pressure sensation as opposed to a, uh, an actual pain. And this pressure problem tends to peak around one hour after the insertion, and in many patients resolves by the f 24 hours after the insertion. And what this means is that the relatively low pain intensity involved with the mini implant insertion uh, may mean that many patients don't need to take analgesics, um, or in these studies, only half of the patients took analgesics after insertion. And indeed, there's very little difficulty or um, conflict in terms of chewing, uh, brushing, and speech interference. Interestingly, oral hygiene is a, does have a bearing and left-sided success rates are generally higher than those on the right side of the mouth. And that's because most patients are right-handed and will keep the left side cleaner. And it's been shown that inflammation does increase uh, the inflammatory reaction and hence reduces the success rate. 
So for instance, in several studies, uh, they showed a success rate of 84% in clean uh, areas, but inflammation resulted in a lower success rate, about 75%. Inflammation tends to be less in thick keratinized tissue, such as on the palate side. And overall, we're best to think that, that variations or limitations in pa patient dexterity and, and oral hygiene will have a bearing. And this is because inf inflammation is a significant risk factor. So finally, what's involved with removal of a mini implant or explantation? Well, several animal studies have examined this, and hist at a histological level, they showed close contact between the, the bone surface and the mini implant surface, which in the loosest definition of osseointegration means that um, these fixtures would technically be regarded as integrated. But yet, in these studies, the, the, the mini implants were all easily removed by unscrewing, so hence the paradox. And this is because physical or bone implant contact is not the same thing as ankylosis and, and reliable definitions of osseointegration in the restorative literature draw a, a, a distinction between bone implant contact and actual integration where, where they regard integration as, as ankylosis. So bone implant contact which gives us mechanical retention is not the same thing as osseointegration and that's why Mini implants are easy to remove just by simple unscrewing. So that concludes uh, the first uh, lecture in this webinar series. And you'll be pleased perhaps to know that the, the subsequent lectures are all much more clinical. So there are lots of clinical slides uh, and radiographs and clinical steps and techniques involved. So. I look forward to welcoming you back for the next lecture in the series, which describes mini implant planning, uh, insertion, and some and uh, applications. Thank you.